Let's start with a prayer here. In the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for your goodness to us and showing us your Son throughout the Scriptures. Maybe through this discussion, understand more deeply how you prepared the human race for your Son. Understand more, more deeply what you've done for us and how you saved us. We entrust this time and this conversation to you through the hands of our Blessed Mother as we say. Hail Mary, Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. Blessed, blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. The Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Just a quick couple of things for the next two weeks. Mm -hmm. TWO, thank you, Shannon. What's up? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so next Stay week is Holy Week, and so we're going to have class then, because I'm going to be busy for Easter. Week after Easter Monday, and I'm going to need a break. So, <laughs> <laughs> yes, <laughs> so we won't have class until the 17th of April. So we'll, next two Mondays, you won't have um, Or if you want to, well, yeah, my, my secretary's word in the slack. Otherwise, I'm picking you hard to this, this class. <laughs> so we're talking about Moses and the Law. We're going to stay focused on, on this, probably this the entire time. Um, there's so much in here that we could talk about. There's so much um, that we could focus on. Um, again, I, I picked certain things, picked certain big ideas, certain principles. Um, obviously questions or other things you want to talk about in addition, please bring them up. Please talk about them. One of my, it's not really a pet peeve, it's the wrong word for it. Um, personal interests, maybe. Uh, one thing that I, I think that I would like people to get more of is how important the Old Testament how important it is for us as Catholics, and how much we need that. Because all too often, I think we as Catholics ignore the Testament entirely, forget what's happening in the Old Testament, and go, well, we know the answer, we know how it all ends up, we know our Lord, so what we need that the old stuff for. After all, it's all been filled, it's all been taken care of, it's all different. There's a problem with this, a few problems. And one problem is that Whenever the apostles and our Lord preach about his coming, they always give the Old Testament. Whenever you read the Old the Church Fathers, they always give the Old Testament. We need to understand this in order to get what our Lord is doing. There, there is certain root, there's certain depth, there's certain beauty that's really missing unless we get this. So let me start here with four verses. I can, we can talk about more. I'm going to do four verses here. You have a written down few on your sheet there. You can also pull them up in your own uh, version. The one I, I took this from the uh, Revised Standard Version, the Nation Study Bible. Uh, but you can also pull it up if you want to from your scriptures, compare translation if you're interested in that too. <laughs> so first thing is about Matthew 5, 17. This is the context of the Sermon on the Mount. This is after our Lord has talked about the Beatitudes. The Lord says this. Think not that I have come to abolish the law of prophets. I have come not to abolish them. The law of the prophets, if you were Jewish, is code phrase for roots of the Old Testament. Obviously, they didn't call it the Old Testament because of the New Testament at the time. But the law, the books of Moses, the prophets, the people after that. Um, sometimes you might even say the law of the prophets and the writings, the, the wisdom books. But the law of the prophets were kind of the big division, uh, the big way they put it. This is why, by the way, uh, if you look at um, the Transfiguration, the two men appear with the apostles, Moses, the law, and, and Elijah. Prophets. They haven't done a bosh of all the prophets and the film. Two verses from Luke after the resurrection. Throw to Emmaus. So he, he realized that he's talking to them. 
Um, the Lord appears in, this, in another form to the two disciples who are masked. And he asks what's going on, and they say, well, there's this dude named Jesus who died and rose again. And we're wondering if he believes the prophet. We're not sure what's going on. And he says, you idiots, let me tell you what's going on. <laughs> Luke says this. Beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted them all in all the scriptures of things concerning himself. It's before he reveal himself to them. And this is when they, their hearts are burning within them and they say, well, stay with us and keep talking with us and showing us how Christ is the Messiah. How he fulfills all the things of the prophets. And then later on, he's talking with the disciples. He's, and he's appearing to the apostles this in the 40 days after the resurrection of the ascension. He said to them, these are my words that I spoke to while I was still with you. But it was before the crucifixion and resurrection. Is everything written about me in the law of Moses? And the prophets? And the Psalms. He has the Psalms. I do the best of the And he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written, that the Christ should suffer on the third day rise from the dead, and that repentance and forgives of sins be preached in his name to all nations. Getting from Jerusalem. Your witnesses to these things. And behold, as the promise of my Father upon you, the Holy Spirit, that stay in the city until you are clothed in power from on high. Um, so again, our Lord himself is saying, this is a big deal. These aren't throw, these aren't throwaway stuff now. In John chapter 5, he's talking to the uh, Pharisees. And he's telling the Pharisees, they don't believe in him. They're not just listening. It's just this. You don't think that I should accuse you to the Father. It's Moses who will accuse you. On whom you set your hope. You don't think, if you believe in Moses, you would have believed me. Because he wrote of me. If you do not believe his writings, how will you believe in my words? So. Is it important to understand the law of Moses? Yes. yes. Yeah. It, this is important. Um, this is a big deal. The thing is, let me we'll, yeah, we'll start, we'll, we'll start there. It's a big deal. Okay. Let's look at it. And so we're going to focus today on that. Again, yeah, this, this is why it really is important to really get what's being said. And even the things that seem to us kind of, well, that's really boring, or well, that's old fashioned, or that's changed now. There's all those old ceremonies, all those old things, all those old feasts. All of them are speaking about us. All of them talk to us about who our Lord is, what he's done for us, and how we're saved. Every single one of them. If you don't read them that way, understand them that way, you're going to miss what's happening. You have to reread them in the light of Christ is being revealed to us through these things. As you go to Leviticus, that talks about tithing, or it talks about you know, the sacrifices, or it talks about some of the examples of the temple. These aren't interesting old things that happened long ago that, you know, is that nice that the Lord did this for these people. This is the Lord telling us about the Son, preparing us for the resurrection, crucifixion, and salvation. Big deal. This is why the Lord himself had to go to teach these people and say, us too, you know, interpreting them on the scripture that this thing's about himself. Um, sorry, one point that I was going to make here. Was it? It's really important. Are you revealing all this? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, the back to our members. You said it was very important. <laughs> Moses was very important. But no, I mean, that, that, that too. There was something else that was going to talk about this. But anyway. I figure the Lord's in charge right now. If I forget, it's his fault. <laughs> so. Here's the other problem with the thunder right now. The Lord gives and the Lord takes it away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. So let's look at some of the ways, in, in, in brief outlined form, some of the ways the, the law talks about God. The first way is cause. In action. 
prophecy and out of prophecy in, in, in life. And you'll see the, that in the Old Testament, some of the prophets um, speak words where they proclaim that well, Christ is going to come and do these things, the Messiah will be these, do these stuff, will be this way, warm here. Um, other times, there are prophecies where they, the, the prophets simply live. So, for example, you have these Ajar of Hosea, who, who marries a, a faithless woman. And it's because his own person, he's showing the people the relationship to Israel and God, where Israel is an unfaithful spouse. To you have Ezekiel, uh, or Jeremiah, um, this, who goes out and digs a hole in the wall with his hand, because it's, it's this earthen wall, a double wall, and walks out carrying a pack on his back. They ask him, what's this mean for us? Because they know it's a prophecy. Um, you have the prophecy where Jeremiah buries an undershirt, and it gets rotten. And he's saying, this is, this is your heart and your soul that goes buried apart from God, and now it's going rotten. No, so some of these are, are, are prophecies in life. And so these feasts, uh, these ceremonies, the temple, the sacrifices, these are all prophecies. They're revealing to us what Christ is doing. Like the, the Red Sea is a revelation and a prophecy of baptism. So the law is a prophecy. Is prophecy always in the future to come? Not always. Not always. No. So okay. prophecy, um, in this, I, I would, no, it's not always in the future. Prophecy can mean simply speaking, literally as speaking from God to man. I'm um, speaking on behalf in God's name to man. So it can certainly be for um, the, the, the people of the time. Obviously, it wouldn't be, it's, it's being spoken to the people of time, but there's a message for them there. And for, for, them, for them to do this right. in, uh, in but, the future, yeah. right? <clears throat> Let's say it's revelation. Um, prophecy, the prophets serve in messages for the people. Personally, I don't really like trying to divide too much. This is for those, for them, not them. This is for us now. Because the fact is, when God writes these words, everything, I mean, people who at the time got it for them, it was for them. And it's also for us now. Right. Um, it's true always, yeah, that it doesn't, it's not meant to be away, that it doesn't cease. Um, and so, yes, I mean, it is a direct, you know, telling them, do these things, understand these things, bring in your heart. Also a prophecy about Christ. Um, I think sometimes we divide it too, too much. We enter the danger of thinking to ourselves, that's just for those people. That part was just for them. Um... And I've seen it happen that way. He's like, I'm not saying you did that, but for example, I'm thinking, for example, um, this is why I, I get annoyed about some of these things. So I, I had a professor in some um, There is the, the book of Isaiah, chapter 6, is Isaiah's call when he becomes a prophet. Right. He's called by God. And it's the story where Isaiah is in the temple, he's the vision of God. It's just the seraphim calling out to God, calling out. And he says, I'm always me, I've seen God, I'm a man with unclean man, I have man with unclean lips, I'm living with people of unclean lips, but I've seen the book of our hosts, always me. And one of the, one of the cherubim comes with the, the tongs, and they even touch the, uh, touch with his hand, the tongs come and touches uh, uh, Isaiah's lips um, with a burning coal. And then says to him, Behold, now let's touch your lips, since you're purified. And then Isaiah is able to have the strength to go say, Here I am, send me. <laughs> in seminary, um, in seminary, um, one of the, this came up in discussions, came up in the class, we were talking about Isaiah. And one of my fellow classmates raised his hand and said, well, what's this, What does this mean something? What does this, what's this mean? And the response to these was, no, it doesn't mean anything. It's, it's, it's just a, you know, it happened once, it's not really that important. Oh, my goodness. 
Well, no. <laughs> <laughs> this is dead wrong. And it's being, this is being taught again by somebody who's a scripture scholar. Probably many ways a lot more exposed than I am. Um, but wrong about this. And, so, sorry. Well, no, no, I was just going to say, that's the prayer that you say before you proclaim the gospel. Right? It, it's for the, the gospel because of what I would preach. Mm-hmm. The Byzantine Church, Eastern, Eastern Catholic Rite, said after communion. Because mm-hmm. the burning coal is the Eucharist. It's, it's a prophecy of the Eucharist. Mm-hmm. Right? So we're unclean, but then God comes and touches us. Mm-hmm. Even the angels don't dare to touch that coal, but that heavenly fire. Mm-hmm. The heavenly fire comes to us to purify us. What we speak now is God's own fire, God's own word. Mm-hmm. But this is a big deal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, it wasn't just for Isaiah, those people long ago. If we if we get that way, we're gonna miss so much. Um, so as, as long as you have that danger in your mind, or you fighting it that way, fine. Uh, definitely there are things, there are times where our Lord and the prophets do speak directly to the people and say, Don't go have dealings with Egypt, which more directly deals with people back up with other us. Uh, that best for us is don't trust anything besides God. You know, that's the lesson for us. For them, literally, was don't go deal with Egypt. <laughs> so, yes, there's still prophecy in the sense of speaking on behalf of God. Um, but the law, and I said the law, in the first five books of the Torah. Uh, and they are proph- they're prophetic, um, especially in the sense of revealing who Christ is. Um, yes, there certainly are literally meant for people. You know, wear these clothes, say these ceremonies, say these prayers, don't eat these things, eat these other things. But they're also prophetic, really for us. Is that? Yeah. Okay. Good. <clears throat> Secondly, they're promises. Now, certainly, this is related to a prophecy. So, obviously, if God's going to tell us that they do something, he's just going to the village. More directly, this is God telling us, I've got your back. I'm going to take care of you. And so he tells, for instance, Moses and Law, you know, there is this promise where God says, if you do these things, I'll be with you. If you do these things, I will watch out for you. Because God's preparing us for this union we're supposed to have with Christ, the great, the sacraments, through his coming as man. Where there was a deeper promise, a deeper union, a more profound gift to us. But there's promises there. And throughout, throughout this whole, the whole law, the genealogy, the numbering, and even the most minute, silly things we're looking at, toss away, there's promises that God is making to his people and helping us. It's not simply a promise or a prophecy, it's also preparation. I didn't deliberately make it alliterative, but then there you go. Lots of peace. Um, <laughs> it's preparation. It's God preparing his people for the coming of the Messiah. See, when our Lord comes and makes the old covenant, it's with the purpose of getting us ready. So when he comes, understand him better. Right. The fact that Moses spoke about and wrote about Jesus wasn't just an interesting thing. It, it's he has ready for Moses. He has ready to receive him. He has ready to welcome him. Understand him. So things like the Red Sea. If we get what our Lord does at a simple human level, at an earthly level, we'll get more deep and profoundly what he's doing at a spiritual level in the baptism. Prepares us. If we're used to talking to God and, and, and worshiping God and making our life for God, we'll get what he says. He comes and says, unless you love me above your father and mother, you, you have a life in there. It's preparing us to accept and receive and understand what he's doing. And it's building a culture. Or if you want to, or a fourth P, say building a people. <laughs> Mm-hmm. 
You see, all of these 613 commandments in the Old Testament, the Ten Commandments, that's 603 other ones. But what you eat, what you wear, the different ceremonies, the different laws, the different feasts, what you're doing in them, the point of them is, is there a way of training you, a culture, training a people to live their days and their life for God. Everything revolves around that. Right? The whole culture is about our Lord. You get up in a certain way, you pray a certain way, you dress a certain way, you eat a certain way, you live a certain way. There's a, there's a rest that happens on a certain day. Even during the harvest, you rest on Sabbath. You pray a certain way. The worship of God, the sacrifices of God, to honor and glorify Him, are established not by men, but by God. God's a sacrifice to me in this way. Talk to me in this way. Pray in this way. These are the, these are the priests why is that? These are the prayers that I give you. And so all this goes away into the New Testament. No. <laughs> no. It should be even deeper than you read it wow. But unless you get what's happened in the Old Testament, you're not going to see what the Lord's doing in the New Testament. It's not coming to get rid of these things, it's coming to deepen them, to perfect them, to fulfill them. Look at what that means to man. Right? These things the Lord is giving us. The Old Testament is making a culture so that people would come and recognize he's coming. There is a book by a convert named Roy Schumann. I believe it's S H O E. And he quotes from Jesus. His title is Salvation is from the Jews. at some of these things. One of the things he says in there, which I found fascinating, is, is, is he says in there, he says, well, did the Jewish people fail? Did this old, this old plan of Christ, the old covenant, fail? It's supposed to be preparing the way and giving a culture towards when the Messiah comes, they'll receive him and recognize him. Did this fail? He says, no. Who were the first converts? They were Jewish. <laughs> Who were the first priests? The first bishops? And he said, he goes to say, if you look at the numbers of, of you know, we have very clear numbers from census. The number of Jewish people in previous to 100 AD is three times higher than this afterwards. What happened to them? They became Christian. In the book of Acts, it says even some of the priests are becoming Christians. Right? Some of the same people who were crying out for Christ's blood who were crucified in Christ, who were there, so some of the, some of the details of, the, of the, their hidden uh, um, talks and discussions with the Pharisees, is after the resurrection, they converted. They came to work. The 3,000 that converted at Pentecost, the 5,000 that converted afterwards. Eventually, the Gentile conquered a number of them greatly, absolutely. And you still have the struggle between the, the establishment with, with the, the temple and What's it mean to be Catholic? Of course, yes. But we, we can't forget about millions of Jews that can become Catholic. Including Our Lady and the Apostles. <laughs> well, wasn't there a name for the first converters that were Jewish? They, they called them something else, not, um, not just Christians. They, there was another name for them that they were just strictly Jews that it, were converting over? Um, not really. I mean, so what you can't still see it, it is um, there is and there isn't. Um, again, part of the discussion, again, that the first 20, 30 years was did you have to become Jewish first to become Catholic? Because there's a right reason. Because it's a big deal. Mm -hmm. And so, how Jewish do you have to be? And it took the council, and it took discussion, and it took fighting, and it took Revelation from God to make it clear what it means to be fulfilled, what it means, how you should you have to be. And there are people that accept it. As occasionally, when there's a, a distinction, what you'll see often is the people who are being referred to are those in acceptance, who, who refuse to listen to it. And so you have the, the apostles, uh, especially Paul talked about the Judaizers. They're the people who don't accept the fact that you have to be Jewish first. Who want circumcision first? 
If you circumcise that, you can't baptize. And what Paul is saying is, no, it's been fulfilled. Because there's something deeper, more important. Um, but, but it was not just those who were converts. It's the people who were converts who didn't want to let go of them. So you had to be Jewish first. Um, or know the Jewish laws. And, right. Right. And, and observe the Jewish laws, even though even if you weren't. Observe the Jewish laws in the Old Testament. Right. Because the Old Testament wasn't written down it was all. It was written down. It wasn't collected. And it wasn't um, codified. It was, so there wasn't a list of books in the Old Testament, um, in, in the sense that, that there wasn't a, a, a official. List. It was scrolls. It was scrolls, but it was also um, there were other books floating out there that, that eventually weren't accepted. Um, the, the, the version that we take is the one that um, we take the, the Greek Tetuagen. Version, um, which was used by Christ and by the early church, we can prove it. As the book, because Christ quotes certain phrases, certain, certain things. You can go back, we can see that there were certain prayers being said. Um, but, but, but there wasn't a. Until Christianity came along and started, acting, started writing new books to say new things, the Jews didn't have reason to say, these are our scriptures. There were these old books. And so the, the list of Jewish scriptures was codified until about 70 AD. Right. Um, so after the fall, of, about the time of the fall of the temple, when the, land, the temple was destroyed, then they had to say these are our scriptures to separate ourselves from them. And then from almost the another 70 years after that, that the actual Bible was put into place. Well, a little, <laughs> more complicated, right a little more complicated than that. Um, because some things that were recognized were born in the need to be defined, right? It, very often in the church's history, things are accepted until they're uh, opposed. And once there's opposition, once there's people saying it's untrue, that's what's getting written down and, and being defined. And so there are lists that go back to the second, third centuries, fourth centuries. Um, but it wasn't actually defined until the 16th century. Um, it was your know, list going back third, fourth century. It wasn't defined in front because there was no need to. Everyone, everyone knew what the, the books were. But then when there was these challenges with some of the Protestant reformers, had to be defined specifically. This is what our books are. No, there had to be proof that this was this, this was that. Right. But you, you can go back into the early church and see what the church fathers are quoting. You can see um, was the list written down in the second, and third centuries. Um, I think the earliest list. But it's not complete because it, it, it's even now. I mean, you'll, you'll find different books written in different ways, right? So the Psalms, 150 Psalms, I have no reason why. But Psalm 10 is split into two in some place, and that's split into one. Um, is Jeremiah Lamentations one book or two books? Depends when you ask. Um, is, are there four books of Kings or two books of Kings? Yeah. Depends when you ask. <laughs> and the translation. And what they're broken up into. Yeah, and it's, all, it's, it's even the exact same stuff. But even as the way it's divided and broken up, up and up. Even chapter and verses. You'll we'll see different translations, mm -hmm. different chapter and verses. Because of the fact they were written at different times. The chapter and verses don't appear. Uh, there, were no, there were no chapters in the Roman Bible. Chapters were editions added, added by the church in the 13th century. Verses were added by a printer in the 16th century. <laughs> I think 1551 was the first time books were written. They were very bright, they helpful. But they weren't, like, and that, John and, and Matthew write, they write chapter 1, verse 3. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. They just wrote. They just wrote. <laughs> and in the, the, the 13th century, the 1221, I believe, is the day. Somewhere around there. Uh, they added chapters. And the 16th century, they added verses. But even today, you'll find different translations and different chapters and verses. But, Sorry. No. <laughs> this is all it's all good. Um, I mean, yes, there's a people being prepared um, so that there is a culture that will accept and receive and understand what Christ is talking about. So when Christ wants to talk about the Trinity, the culture that receives this first understood there's one God. When Christ talks about grace and baptism, the culture that first understands Old Testament sacrifices. When the Lord comes to talk about the crucifixion, 
There's first the preparation of the Passover. One of the things, reasons why I think sometimes this doesn't sink in as deeply as it could to us, we're trying to probably do it backwards sometimes. Because we miss all this preparation. You know, sometimes we don't quite get the, the, the more heady, more difficult stuff. Right. Um, and I think this is important. This is a big deal. Now, this was one of my, and pet peeve is the wrong term for it, but I like that term. Is that your bad word that you can't feel comfortable using? Is that your secret bad word? Your secret bad word. My secret bad word is fudge muffins. <laughs> <laughs> I never say fudge muffins, no, I'm annoyed. That's what I'm really annoyed. That's what you hide, right? <laughs> Sorry. So, two questions then. Oops, we're supposed to back up. Questions for, for me, for it going. Okay. Two questions then for you. Question one. What does it mean to fill it all? I mean, the Lord says everything's uh, abolished. But yet we, eat, we can eat shellfish and we can eat hoof mammals. And later on in the book of Acts, you know, Peter has a vision where he's told everything's clean. But doesn't that mean things have been abolished? No. Bad man, bad man. Well, nobody's talking about Moses. I mean, God, God said, don't eat shellfish and don't eat these things and don't uh -huh. eat pork. And later on, he said, all things are clean. Did, did that mean he abolished them? Did he abolish them, or would, when Christ gave his life, did he fulfill? Well, was to, it to clean he said, those animals as well as us? Didn't he say what comes out is unclean? Yeah, uh, or? It's and not what goes in. Nothing that enters with a man. Yeah, yeah. The <laughs> right. I'll paraphrase it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, that too. and that comes from the heart. Yes. And so there are things that are changed. Of course, things are different. Mm -hmm. And so our Lord is not saying nothing's different. Obviously, things are different. Christ died to say this. God became man. Everything is different. <laughs> right. <laughs> mm -hmm. So everything's different. But he's, but, he's, but, but he's trying to emphasize it's not simply forget that stuff. Ignore that stuff. So the fill can mean complete. The Old Testament needs the New Testament. Right? Everything was leading to the New Testament. Right. The, pur the purpose of it was to get us ready for Jesus Christ. Now the, now the New Testament, what good is it? Not much. I mean, it's, it's good in the sense that God came to us and saved us, but not fully because Christ didn't come. But Philip, you can fill you a promise. Right? These are promises. So the things of the salvation, sorry, you see. Yes. Um, so the, the, the things that the Lord tells us he's going to do for us, the way he's going to redeem us, the Lord keeps. Old Testament's the promise being made, Old Testament is Christ keeping that promise. Old Testament is Christ saying what he's going to do, Old Testament is Christ actually doing it. It also means to give a meaning to it. This time I spelled too correctly. <laughs> See, the Old Testament sacrifices mean nothing without Christ. How is it that this, the sprinkling of the blood of the heifer and the cow, even though it's meant something, Satan said, help cleanse from sin? Because they were prophecies that pointed to Christ. It was about faith in Jesus Christ. They were preparing, and, and what it was, because it was this faith. It was probably explicitly not understood by everybody. So some of the prophets understood it. Some of the saints understood it. Not everybody did. But it was this faith in what Christ is going to do by dying on the cross and saving us. Right? It, nowhere in scriptures does it say, you know, Jesus Christ at the age of 33 is going to die on the cross for the Romans. But you do, it doesn't say that. What you do have is you have the Lamb of Sacrifice. You have 
the, the temple of sacrifices. You have the vision of Abraham. And they have the, you have so many things. Christ says, gospel of Luke. This is, it says of me, I think Christ would suffer and die and rise again, and they would be preaching for salvation of the nations. It's in there. And so, that, so without, without it being in there, these things have no teeth. But the reason why the Old Testament law means something and is beautiful, yes, it is God talking to man, it is by itself beautiful. There's a deeper, more important, more, more real beauty. Because it's revealing and showing to us what Christ is, who Christ is, what he's doing to us, and how I'm saved by Jesus Christ. Yeah, big deal. So, completes it, keeps a promise, and gives a meaning to it. My second question to you. So, Christ several times says, both speaks about it. My question to you is where? By the prophets, it's very clear. Isaiah chapter 7. The virgin shall be with, with child. You know, um, you have in the book of Judges, a star shall rise at, at, at Bethlehem. Book of Isaiah. You know, the suffering servant. Where does Moses speak about Christ? You got these laws. You got the temple being built. You have numbers. You have the people exodus. Where does Moses speak about Christ? Genesis 15, 1. <laughs> <laughs> you're, not, you're not wrong. <laughs> is, is it when Abraham uh, was going to sacrifice his son during that time and, uh, and the angel stopped him? Because that was going to be the ultimate sacrifice to God. And then... Oh. Well, was, that was Moses. The first five books. We yeah, that was Moses, right? Yeah. But it was about Abraham. At the very least, it was understood to be Moses um, by the Jewish people at the time. So when Christ says Moses, he means the first five books. So it was Abraham surrendering his son, which is going to be Christ being surrendered by God. That, son. Yeah. that certainly is one place, yes. <laughs> okay. So I got one <laughs> no, no, you're, you're all wrong. You're wrong. No, don't lose that. Keep that. Okay. Let's talk. <laughs> so I, I'm going to show you four places, and hopefully this would, my, the point of showing you four places. A, a, and there's not going to be like four Bibles, but four ways. Uh, four very profound ways. That it's, it's everywhere. It's soaked in these things. And the point of it is hopefully at the end of this, hopefully, We've got some principles to understanding the way the Lord speaks, the way Moses speaks. Even when it comes to those boring, strange, rhythmic laws and ceremonies and feasts. So what's going on? All about us. So let's look at first place, first section is the ten words and the one. When we hear the law, what do we think of? The Ten Commandments. Ten Commandments. <laughs> right, for the Jewish people, they thought of a lot more than that. They thought of every, the foundation of the word of people. Ten Commandments. In the scripture, they're not called the Ten Commandments. In Hebrew. They're, they're just the commandments. They're the ten words. And a word in the sense that we talk about seven last words of Christ. Right? The more the more than literally ten words, literally seven words, there are seven phrases, seven things being told to us by God. So these are the ten words of God. That are, that are the heart of the law. God speaking to his people. It says the, the word speaking to, to God. Well, God's word speaking to us. Throughout the scripture, you will see this repeated phrase 
that the word of God spoke to me. The word of God came to the prophet. The word of God came to Abraham. The word of the Lord. Remember, Lord, she capitalized usually is Yahweh. I mean, God's own name. Translate that. So Genesis 15, 1. After this, the word of the Lord came to Abraham the vision. How does the word of the Lord come to you? What do you mean the word of the Lord came to you? The word is Jesus. The word is Jesus. The word is Jesus. Good. <laughs> We're paying attention. <laughs> <laughs> Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 4. Follow oh, Jeremiah. Now the word of the Lord came to you. Verse Samuel. The boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord over Elon. And the word of the Lord was rare in those days. There was no forgiveness. vision. John chapter 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him. That would have been anything made that was made. In Him was life, and the life was light of man. So, in the Old Testament, God sent His ten words. In the Old Testament, God sent His one word. This just begins to scratch the surface. Let's go deeper. So, we talk about law. Unfortunately, we have in our culture day and age, we're very anti-law. We don't like it. We don't like this. And we like thinking of ways to get around this. What's the minimum I have to do? <laughs> What's the least I got to do? Is it okay to do this if I don't do that? Can I bargain with God? Surely God didn't mean that. Surely the law has changed now. Surely that's old fashioned. Surely that law is only for those dumb people that were so smart and intelligent we need these laws now. You don't like it. For the Jewish people, for many sane people, law was more than just these external chained bindings to something. Law, in fact, is, you could say, the ordering principle of the universe. What gives the universe order? What gives the universe rule? What gives the universe, makes the world go round? It's law. Now, in the end, what is it that gives the universe creation order? Who is it that gives the universe creation order? <laughs> God. God is the ordering principle of the universe. Everything that's made and created reflects God. Everything that God makes is going to be done with order, harmony, and beauty. With reason, with purpose, with meaning. When God gives people his law, it's not God saying, these are my rules, better obey them or else, because I want to make them just give you these things. It's God guiding our hearts, our souls, our lives to become like him. The law makes us like God. The law shows us how to live like God. The law shows us how to become like God, to think like God, to love like God, how to walk with God. The ordering principle the universe of themselves, all of us reflect God. Remember, for the Jewish people, the word of the Lord coming was God speaking to his people, showing them who he is, helping them to know him, guiding them to himself. Do you think John has in mind we used to be talked about the word was, was with God? Absolutely. Could he have more? Sure. There's all kinds of Greek stuff too, and all the Greek philosophy as well, but I can't even to about the word. Wisdom chapter 7. Let's look at how the wisdom talks about law. Again, for the, for the Jewish people, wisdom and law is the same thing. Right? To become like God is wise. To know God is smart. To, to walk with God, to, to become like God, to know God, to love God, to serve God is smart. To not serve God, not love God, not love God is dumb. The Book of Wisdom, chapter 7, describes wisdom like this. Wisdom is remote by any emotion. Because of her pureness, she pervades and penetrates all things. But nothing is without wisdom, because God created it. She is a breath of the power of God, a pure emanation of the glory of the Almighty. 
May for nothing defile his efforts into her. He's a reflection of eternal life, while this mirror of the working of God, an image of God's goodness. The book of Sirach, chapter 24, says very specifically, wisdom is the law. Wisdom is the book of law. So now if you read those of the prophets talking about the law, talking about, about wisdom, the same thing. <coughs> now Christ is the ordinary principle of the universe. Christ is the creator. Christ is the image of God. Christ is the one that runs everything revolves around. <coughs> now the law isn't Christ, but the law reflects Christ or parallel of Christ because the law speaks about Christ. <coughs> the law the law is a, is a human, is a earthly reflection of the glory of Christ. This is me saying this, this is scripture saying this. Hebrews chapter 1. A blessing. Easy on the truth. In many and various ways, God spoke of all to our fathers and the prophets. But in these last days, he spoke of us by his son. The point heir of all things, when he created the world, right? God created the world through wisdom, it says the Old Testament. It reflects the glory of God. Wisdom is the glory of God. We understand his nature, for the universe by his word of power. Christ is the wisdom of God. Look at the Colossians. He, Jesus Christ, is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. Written of all things from created, heaven and earth, visible or invisible. But the thrones or dominions or powers, powers or authorities all created through him and for him. The church father, they talk about creation and redemption. They say it's fitting that Christ, the one who comes, becomes man. Of the person the Because they say the universe, the creation, is a reflection of Christ. Uh, Jesus is God's son, the perfect image of the Father. Creation is an image of the image. All created through him, all created for him. In him was the life of the world. He is the, that's why he's the ordering principle of the universe. And so when, when human beings sin, defile ourselves, the image of God, the image of God comes to restore the image of God in us, to heal that image likeness of God in us. God's own image, God's divine image, God's divine son comes to make us sons in his own sonship. We you could say, the one word came to restore what was lost in us as God the Lord. How does God create? He speaks. And the word became flesh dwelt among us. And we saw his glory, the glory of the Father's only begotten Son. So even the very fact then that we have the law and wisdom and the word of God being spoken to man, this is Christ preparing his own way to come in the flesh. The word of the Lord came to me and said, Christ came to me and said. Now it's not it's direct, it's listen like that, it's not direct like that. It's a preparation and the Lord getting, hinting, preparing, and showing who's speaking, why it's being said, how he's preparing us. There's a lot in there. <laughs> Let me make sure that that, 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 that this pause there. Questions to make sure it's understood. Right. Okay. Um, going back to creation. Yes. Okay. If Adam and Eve were directly created by God and did no sin, <laughs> correct? So we were already born with the wisdom of, of God. Mm -hmm. And then as we became sinful people, we started losing that, um, that grace of God of knowledge, and now all of a sudden we're having to have the laws to come back to it. Is is, is that my understanding? Is that correct? Yes. Yeah, so the, the law, Old Testament law, prepared the way. It was completed by Christ as coming in the flesh. Yes. Okay. Yes. Um, so one of the things to notice is image and likeness. Right. We're created in God's image and in God's likeness. The image refers to the soul. We have intellect and free will. We can love God, we can know God, we can serve God. Like this refers to grace. 
Original sin, we lose the likeness to God. We retain the image, but it's wounded. And part of those wounds mean it's harder to know God's will, harder to do the right thing. We know God's even if we know it. And we get confused and we lose that. And as we go on through history, we lose more and more of these people. I mean, we get a culture which makes it easy, which encourages us, makes us confused. And so God comes and heals the culture first, repairs the way, and then becomes and restores the image, and gives us a way to salvation. So as the Israelites were like in the desert and they, you know, made the molten calf and everything like that, they kept falling away in the likeness because they, yeah. did, because they didn't go with their heart or what their heart's telling them and what God put in their heart right. to, to follow that. And, and, and more explicitly, the Lord, the Lord was saying, wait for me and worship me in this way. And they were saying, we're going to worship God at all. Right, because of society? Because of society, because of human fear, because of human... All kinds of things. Right, I mean, yeah. Every, every, every excuse? Every excuse. Okay. Right, I mean, they're human beings. Right? <laughs> what excuses do we use when we for our sins? Right, right. <laughs> There's just one. <laughs> if only there was just one. <laughs> Yeah. So, so the law is a, is, a, is a more profound statement, and the same thing does the word. Just that itself is a, is a, is a proclamation, a revelation of Christ. Questions? Okay. Am I making sense? Yes. yes. Ish? Yes. <laughs> We could spend you know, months and years in this class in one of these things. <laughs> or for It's all so beautiful. God, God is so smart. <laughs> <laughs> and patient. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Which we're grateful. <laughs> the book of Exodus, chapter 25. When God's talking about the temple, he says, you're going to make the curtain this way, you're going to make the, the, the bells this way, and the washing this way, and the altar this way, and the, or the covenant this way, it ends with this phrase. See, so you make the map the pattern for them, which is being shown to you on this mountain. Moses had a vision of heaven. Moses was talking to God, seeing God, recognizing God. And when God was telling him, build a temple this way, worship this way, sacrifice this way, dress the priest this way, do the feast this way, it's a reflection of heaven itself. And one of the things that matters to us, first of all, is how we build our churches. It's not just a building that houses the Eucharist, though of course there's that as well. It's meant to be, it's designed to be, it's supposed to be designed by God, pointing to heaven, speaking to us of Christ, showing us who the Son is, help us understand what God has done for us, what He's doing for us, and how to be saved. This building should be a homily and stuff. When you walk in there, you should say, it's like being in heaven. You walk in there, you should, should be preached at simply by the design of the building. You should point your heart, and your mind, and your soul toward God. An ugly church preaches badly. An ugly church can actually preach heresy. Right? It's, it, these things matter because God Himself designed this. Um, one of my professors um, in the seminary, different seminary, I went to four seminaries, <laughs> um, said, to, said to me once, he said, You know, one of the problems we have is because with church architecture these days, the architects don't go back in the Bible. You know, in the Bible, God designs the first ten times. He approves the second one. And all of a sudden, we come along and think approve one. Because we're modern. <laughs> well, there's a reason why the Lord gave us the, you know, these things. And it's not, it's not it's supposed to be a, a, a exact copy and duplicate and replica. No. But there are symbols, there are signs, there are ways of speaking to us that we need to understand what he's doing. Um, not that, that this is a 
plastic architecture. But some, some simple things is, um, first of all, it should be solid. It should speak to us that, that there is an eternity of God. If a church looks like it's going to fall apart, you come in there, you're not going to think God's, God's eternity. <laughs> if a church looks fragile, you're not going to come in there and think about um, you know, God's word and, and God's faith of being a, a firm thing. You go into some of those old stone buildings or the wall of the buildings, you think, this is pretty cool. You know, this has lasted for millennia. This has been here for a while. This is going to be here for a while. Right? It's the fact that it's solid. You come to some of these modern churches, the Gothic buildings. You don't think, this is going to be here forever. You think, okay, this interesting fashion that was back in the days, it's going to change something. It's, what you, it's what's being taught about the faith, just with that building. <clears throat> Faith is changing. God is changeable. These are lies. Um, is your point up toward heaven? So very often in the churches of, of Europe and in the scriptures, you'll see the greatest decoration is higher up. It's the more plain at the bottom, and the, the higher up you go, the more effective. That's why the roofs are decorated. Because you're pulling your heart toward heaven, but your heart toward God. Higher up and further in. Because what's further in? The covenant, holy of holies, God's presence, tabernacle of the Eucharist. So the higher up, the further in. Direct your heart, your mind, your soul, your love toward God. An image of heaven. Um, we'll leave that part alone for now, but let's, let's look a little deeper at this. Let me stop the question on this so far. Let me, just, let me stop there. I'll, go, I'll stop my ranting for right now. <laughs> I just a quick question. Yeah. Um, in I, in the where I'm at in the Bible right now, it's um, with the, I think Ezekiel, and it's going through all of the the measurements and mm -hmm. the, yes. and yeah, yeah, all over again, just like it did you know previously. Yep. What is the, I haven't. Really figured out what the reasons for that is. There's a couple different things in there, yes. So, so what I'm referring to it is that um, it says that the heaven is 140,000 cubits long, yeah. 100,000 per cubits high, wide. So it's a perfect cubit per square. Look, Revelation repeats the exact measurements, mm -hmm. but it says that they put the cross. It's very explicit. It's the measurement of Christ. But 144,000, let's start here. 12 times 12. Old Testament, New Testament. Um, you also have in perfection, it's a cube, because everything is everything's guided by God. You have the four corners of the world. Um, and churches in the Middle Ages, they would very deliberately build the church as high as it was tall. That's why you have those very tall towers. Was because they would measure it. They wanted the tower, the bell tower, the vessel tower to be the same height as the length of the church. So it would have these cubes. In our church over here, the reason why you have the diamond pattern yeah. mm -hmm. is those that's a square. It's a cube. Mm -hmm. this, this is a reference to 144,000. Um, you can only work with the way that I got it. <laughs> <laughs> Best I can do. Maybe they're on the side of the diamond rather than on the side. They can also point the four corners of the, of the world and the cherubim and everything else, too. There's all kinds of stuff walking into there. But the reason why there is that diamond pattern is because it is that reference to Christ, a reference to the heaven itself. And is that why the Perfect. altar is supposed to be on the east wall? Because who comes from the east? Christ. Christ, the rising sun, the warrior from on high. And Sun rises in the east. That's why we have three gates. In the tabernacle, there are three gates coming closer to our Lord. Um, the Holy of Holies, the court of the, of the people, the court of the priests. Um, and so, yeah, that's why we have the communion rail, the yeah, door, uh, the church, and the door over here. Three gates, just like the temple. Wasn't Ezekiel and Jeremiah apocalyptic writings? Um, they were, um, but they're also. Descriptions of, yeah, I mean, the popular writings are complicated because they refer to something current. They, they discuss yeah. the mass, they discuss yeah. liturgy, they also discuss the, the future and the end times. Right. Um, so they're heaven and earth and a mixture of everything between them. Mm -hmm. And that's where kind of the buildings yeah. start coming in, too. 
right. was from now until right. eternity. Yeah, and so does the architecture reflect this? Right? The architecture in some way should reflect that. The architect should speak this in some way. Now, the architectural, all it do is we paint symbols on the wall. You know, I mean, it would have been nice if we could, you know, had you know, great marble ceiling. <laughs> um, but you want something that speaks that, that reflects that, that shows that, that there's perfection and order measurement. Just a little bit of a tangent. Sure. How, since we're on the temple, how about the modern Zionist movement and the building of the next temple in Jerusalem? So the modern Zionist movement goes back to the second or third centuries. Um, so there was an attempt in the fourth century by a pagan emperor to disprove Christ by building a new temple. The name is Julian. Um, and there was a bunch of miracles that prevented from happening. Um, the, the building site, all of a sudden there'd be these strange lightning storms that would come out of nowhere, and fire from the ground, earthquakes. Um, interesting story, but there has been an attempt for a long time. Um, it all depends on why and what, right? Um, are you, for, so for instance, if, if, if you have a Passover meal, speak about Christ and help them understand who Christ is, right? You have a Passover meal saying, this is what saved us, Christ is interesting, whether we need, we need this too, this isn't just important to Christ, then you're speaking, you're false. Same action, two different meanings. Um, very, so if it's a Christian trying to build the temple, they misunderstood something. Because they're trying to go back to what was as though Christ didn't come and then change everything. If it's a Jewish person building, that's more understandable because they want, the, they want their temple back. The temple is the center of the worship. Um, but the temple has been replaced now by the altar. In the church. Um, the thing is, this is the temple. Even though it, it's small and simple and built of, you know, um, it, it's, it's humble, but it's the temple. And the temple over in Holbrook is the, is the temple. And over in Pine Top, it's the temple. Because it makes the temple be the temple of the presence of Jesus Christ. Right. I have a question, but forgive my ignorance. I'm a convert, and I don't understand all the symbols. Under the uh, likeness of Joseph, I noticed that there's a mm. church mm. Uh, in the mm -hmm. Middle. Right. And I've been wondering for quite some time why the one wall was. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that too. Because our church is old and strong is that that literal? Yeah, we asked him. No. It's someone broke it has a picture. Oh, really? Yeah. I was like, I thought it had this big deep meaning. Yeah. I mean, I would think about it other than when I'm in mass, and then I forget later to ask him. I see Father every day. I can ask him. I can ask him. I can make a meeting up if you want me to. <laughs> but no, it, it, some of them might have broken, hasn't been fixed yet. Uh, there, there is something that's supposed to go to fix it. So I asked her. Hadn't happened yet. Father, <laughs> <laughs> in this day and time, it might be a reason. <laughs> it's the symbol of our sins, breaking the church of Christ, or the body of Christ. Honestly, come on in, there's going to be lots of people. That's a much happier meeting. <laughs> That's funny. But but no, it, it, it's it's because someone broke it somewhere down the road. And I have promises, but no action. <laughs> oh, that's I, mountain time. <laughs> yeah. Right. And you don't want me fixing it; it's a little worse. <laughs> you know how some when you walk into some churches or cathedrals, you just it just hits you that yeah. the presence. Yeah. And uh, it's not, but I, I converted, uh, but, uh, oh, unfortunately, but uh, in uh, Wichita, at uh, St. Francis Regional Medical Center, there's a, a church inside the, uh, the, the hospital was built around it. And I used to go in there at lunchtime, because uh, I worked up in the lab, and I go in there at lunchtime, and I, I swear I could, I, I could just hear his voice. 
all the time. Mm -hmm. And it was just, uh, <laughs> you, you know, you get the shivers. I, I remember a home was given by one of my former pastors when I was growing up. Um, and unfortunately, being the distracted servant of Lars, <laughs> there are many homilies. Remember this one. Anybody who said, you know, entering this church because we're coming to God's presence, you should, you should feel the presence. You should leave everything behind worthily when you walk through these doors. You should come here and recognize something different about this room than any other room. Um, and here's one reason why there's this atrium here. I mean, yes, it's nice to meet and to have a class and chat and have coffee and donuts, whatever. But more importantly, we're shedding behind not just coats and hats and, and, and mud, but earthly faults. We're putting beside us those things that weigh us down. We're trying to open our hearts and minds to the Lord and come into His presence. Because, yeah, He's everywhere, but He's here in a unique way, especially He's here physically. Um, and, and so there is, yeah, we're simple, but profound. Um, there is so much meaning, even in our little church. There, there is so much meaning and so much. Um, no, I'm going to add to it. Yes, I do. <laughs> um, we're going to be adding a few more things here and there as we go along. Um, but there is very, very deliberate things, very deliberate ways that the church has been built. Um, even as humble as we are and simple as we are, and as much as the, the structure of the building looks like a, a double wide trailer. <laughs> it does mean not. Pretty. No, it doesn't. I used to drive by here years ago when I was still living in the valley, and I started going to church down here, but I always would come by and go, that is such a beautiful church, I, and I know eventually we're going to retire, and I was drawn to it. <laughs> Staying last. But isn't being humble the greatest? <laughs> Not when it comes to God. Because God, in this humility, comes to earth to us. You also have to reflect his majesty and his glory. Francis of Assisi, who lived in poverty, he died by a single thing. Literally, he, he, when he died, he said, strip me, but the meat of meat died with nothing. Um, the imitation of our Lord. He built cathedrals. He said, when it came to God, the best is good enough. Old Testament, he, he, he asked for gold. He asked for silver. He asked for certain things. Because it's how you show people who he is. Mm -hmm. Now, if I as a priest I say, well, that definitely includes my car and my shoes and my clothes. <laughs> no. Him, yes, not us. And part of our humility, because we need to have this, it's, we need, need that, that, those pressures and, and those, that beauty. Because if you come into a church that's ugly, that speaks to us about God in a certain way, that's the other is beautiful, it speaks to God about to God at us in another way. And everything about the church reflects who God is. So this is why, again, God designed the first church. God showed us what God told us this. What is red and purple stuff when they're talking about designing the, like, it, it, the it's a, it's a, it means uh, like, a, like a wool cloth. And um, the colors are like royalty? Is that royalty okay. and also red for blood. Oh, okay. So if the king comes and he's going to shed his blood, that's why it's purple and red mixed together. Okay. But, but so, sometimes right. beauty can be different because I remember a mission in simple. California. Simple. But I went into no, a, no. I went into a yeah. beautiful, yeah. austere church and it was sure. just filled with the Spirit of God. Sure. And we had to kneel on the floor. There were no kneelers. There were there were no conveniences. It was just the altar, yeah. the cross, and God. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it was Catholic Church. I mean, no, no, I, I, absolutely no. I'm not, I'm not saying that simple can't do it. Yeah, saying. sometimes I feel like when things are too gilded and stuff that we're we're concentrating on the the worldly value instead of it can be can be. Um, <clears throat> sure. No, I mean, there, there definitely are times when a building can, um, we can earn a couple of things. Yeah. <laughs> we can earn many things. Um, but the mere fact that something is rich and gilded does not mean that it's not speaking of our Lord. Um, and the mere fact it's not gilded means it's not speaking of our Lord. Right. Um, 
But the fact is, it has to be designed to speak of our Lord. It has to be literally meant to do that. Mm -hmm. And the fact of, of human nature being what it is, we understand more of God's glory and God's greatness in a great in a building that's great and glorious. Right? So it's just, it, it's like if, if I served you wine at this <coughs> I can give you the, the finest champagne, serve me a Dixie cup, it doesn't change the champagne. Right. But what's it, what's it, what's it tell you to give you the Dixie cup? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, <laughs> I wouldn't well. care. <laughs> <laughs> it's wine, if you give me great champagne, I'm going to But it does speak, but there's, it's not that you care, but giving a nice last speaks the certain way. Right, it shows yeah. that you have regard for it. Correct. Regard for it, regard right. for it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Respect for that person. Respect, yeah. And if all I got is Dick's cup, right. <laughs> Fine, you know, you're not going to be upset by it. It's still, still great wine. You know, it's still very champagne. But serving it in a nice glass, in a nice way, does mean that additional, that additional goodness. And so, yeah, so that the champagne. So when you come to dinner, I gotta get the china out, right? <laughs> <laughs> no, give me Dixie Cup and, uh, this is me you're talking about. Is that where the gold chalice comes in? That's the gold chalice comes in, because you look at the, the here, that's the Lord of gold. Everything that just God is gold. Right. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And also, there's other, other symbols, symbols too. You know, um, gold was as a living metal. It, it changes heat. It, it uh, Awesome. It, it's moving, it, it warms up in your hands, the other metals don't. Um, it's seen as precious, it's, it's a metal for the king. Is, that, is um, that why they were so offended when they came in and raided the church and taking all that and were defiling the yeah, child? Because they, they were sacred for God. Right, yeah. and nobody else was allowed to be doing that. Right, so they, they took things for God and so said, these are not for us. In other words, God is less than we are. It was a very deliberate insult to, to God. You know, uh, so when, when Nebuchadnezzar drank yeah, from, from that, yeah, yeah it, was, it was a very deliberately saying, God is not that. Right. We're as great, we're greater than God. We, we conquered God. You know, when he built this big thing up and it started falling down, John. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, what the church says is you want, but this, this was not kind of what I wanted, it was bending to go on, but that's interesting. <laughs> it's related. The church says the usually noble symbols. So noble meaning glorious and beautiful. But simplicity, in other words, don't focus on it, it's constructed simply to show off. And you can tell what something is. Mm -hmm. Don't really show off, it's constructed simply to focus upon the people in the building, there's a problem. But if it's ugly and it's not looking like heaven, there's also a problem. Mm -hmm. And so noble simplicity doesn't, you know, um, noble simplicity you know, can mean you know, places like St. Peter's or, or um, um, the, those, some, some of the great cathedrals of like Sharp. Sharp. Uh, those, those are very nobly simplistic. Nobly simplistic today. Mm -hmm. um, both of these together are important because, again, built upon what are the last four of the Old Testament and New Testament, based upon the culture there, that all this stuff tells us he's a king, he's important. Um, it's not that, that, that God needs a golden chalice. Who cares, right? He doesn't really care. But we need to give him a golden chalice because, because if we don't give him the best we can, I'll give him less than my best. First crops. First, first crops, yes. Was that? Back to Cain and Abel. Cain, exactly. Cain and Abel. Yeah. Um, Cain is best. Cain. Look, for example, the temple in the book of the Samuel. Right, God has asked David to build him a temple. But David builds him because he wants to give God the best. God blesses him. And later on, other kings want to not give God a temple. Look at Ezra, when they say, we want to build our house first, palace first. God says, no, you give me a temple first. You build my, my house first. Mm -hmm. And now that, that they know what to do, they've given them their best, they've tried to buy that from God, and God says, no. I'm not, you're not being blessed because you're to give me your best. <laughs> now, your best, you know, but those might, the alabaster perfume that was worth $40,000. God doesn't care, as long as it's your best. 
And so, if all we can give God is, a, is the simple coin, great, right, because we love stuff. But if we can give God more, we're giving him the simple coin, he goes, wait a minute. Not because he needs it, because we need it. It's good for us to give it that way. It's necessary for us to give it that way. And, and so, yeah, simple church can be gorgeous. Well, I think this little church is wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> and that, that includes ourselves. Absolutely. Yeah, given the more important ourselves to go. More important the building is like ourselves. Right. Mm -hmm. Right? The building should speak to what we should be. The building is nice. What's the but the point of it is you should go in there and say, oh, I you know, if God deserves on the outside, what's he deserve when I receive? Mm -hmm. What's he deserve when I kind of pray to? And how I can honor him. And the fact is, being the way we are, we tend to start with needing the help on the outside. Right, I mean, well, a little kid, you pray for say thank you for the meeting of right. and hopefully the raggedy comes along after that. You start with the external, you start with the outside, you don't end there, but hopefully you train your heart. And the fact is we all need that as human beings. We all need to be trained, our heart needs to be trained. And so we begin by saying, I'm give God the best I can here, but pray my heart to give God the best I can here. And so even if this gets destroyed, I'm still giving God the best I can in my heart and my soul. Absolutely. Absolutely. Well, <laughs> anyway. <laughs> should we stop here? It is almost 7 20. Or, or should we continue on and get through with keep going so we can get through? It's up to you. I'm, I'm, I'm happy. This is great. I love this stuff. I'm a nerd. <laughs> it's going to be two weeks till we come back. I can stay. Yeah, I mean, yeah. <laughs> okay. You don't? We should stay. Uh, uh, I'm yeah, we should stay. Stop your point, too. Oh. That way we can cover it fully in case there's other questions that come up. Oh, that's true. <laughs> I'm happy either way. Uh, let's, let's take a show of hands. Who wants to keep, the, let's keep going now? Wait, what? Keep show going. of hands. Who wants to keep going right now? Okay. Either way. I'm writing with her so oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think the majority would like to stay. Okay. We're sorry, Ian. We'll, we'll keep the questions down. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll try to not skip things, but I'll try to keep things going at a good pace. <laughs> Remember, the temples are just talking about heaven. The temple is talking about Jesus. This is me talking. This is our Lord talking. John chapter 2. He just answered them, Destroy this temple, and if you I'll raise it up. The Jews then said, It's taken 46 years to build this temple. Uh, Herod and Herod was trying to make a glorious kind of buy support for himself. He wasn't really Jewish. And he'll raise it up in three days. They spoke of the temple that was bought. Uh, the temple was where God was worshipped, the temple is where God is known. Temple is where, where God put God sacrifice to, which is Christ. Where God is known, where God is worshipped, where God is loved. We come to meet God, we come to do, do the great sacrifice. Look at Revelations. There was no temple in the city of heaven. For its temple is the Lord God of the Almighty and the Lord. Right. The, the purpose of a temple, the purpose of, of a tabernacle, is to meet God. To worship God, to pray to God, to walk with God. Who is Christ? He is God, we meet God, we walk with God, we can know God, and we come to love God. He is our sacrifice. This is how Christ is our temple. So we meet God Christ face to face. Here on earth, we are not there yet. We have had a building. But your point to teach us who Christ is, showing us what heaven's like, and showing us what our Lord's done for us, who our Lord himself is. Right? A, a good building well design should say Jesus Christ is King, is Savior, is God, is here. Here is who he is, here is done for us, here is who he loves you. Here is who you love him. The temple is the reflection of heaven. The temple is the place where we God. The temple is the place where we love God. Um, there's all kinds of places in the temple itself described where God's presence is known, where God's met, where we have mercy. But in the altar of the temple, because that's where the blood was sprinkled and sacrificed, what happened, where God's name was spoken. 
And then God came redeem and forgave his people, which happens in Christ. And so this building isn't just a reflection of heaven, it's a profoundly a reflection of Jesus Christ. Which is why the book of Revelation doesn't just say that it's not a thousand is a perfect thing. It says it says it's the perfect map. It is the number of Jesus Christ. Because it's showing us what it is. Good, cool. <laughs> so is the tabernacle itself in the church, is it also that way? Wait, in terms of same height. Um no because that is but no. Um they're the design differently. I've never seen never sort of talked about with that height and width. Um but if you notice tabernacle means dwelling. Um and so the church is called a tabernacle. Um, the tabernacle for the tent dwelling, God's presence. Um, then you have the temple, which is the building. And but you have the presence of God, which is the tabernacle. Mm -hmm. Going back to the old time, the previous to the uh, King David's temple. Um, where the Ark of Covenant was, where God's presence shone, Moses met God so face to face. And so you have the, the, the contrast there, where you have the main building temple, where David gave his best to glorify God and show his love for God. And the tabernacle, God, we meet God face to face, speak to God, and are filled with His glory. Uh, but in terms of the dimensions, you know, in some churches, back in the early church, they, they, were, they were designed to be built like doves, um, and they were hung over the altar. Um, and so, other places, they're, not, they're designed for churches. There's certain places in Rome, and they are you know, about 12 feet long, probably wide, like 30 feet tall. Wow. That's the tabernacle. They're, they're pretty incredible. Um, so, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Uh, but going back to the 11th, 10th, 11th centuries, yeah. Um, it always connected with the old first science. Um, sacrifice itself, of course, speaks to us about our Lord. Um, you mentioned, Fred, the book Abraham. Um, where Isaac says to Abraham, Here is the fire in the wood, where is the lamb they will offer? Abraham said, God himself by the lamb, Rippered offering my son. And God provides the lamb of God, the Passover lamb. God provides Christ himself. Every sacrifice in the Old Testament speaks to us about Christ. It prepares the way for his sacrifice. It shows us that eating with God happens through blood, it happens through innocent blood. Happens through one who um, stands for us, walks with us. We draw to him in our heart, but he takes our place. Now, Christ does this more profoundly than the patent the Lamb does, because Christ is, first of all, God. But second of all, he's able to be both representing us, but also he's one of us. He is walking among us, he does, he is giving himself fully, he's giving our humanity. Our humanity is sacrifice. In a way that couldn't be sacrificed before. Our humanity is raised from the dead. Our humanity um, belongs to God in a whole new way now because Christ is our pastor and sacrifice. <laughs> and so, whenever the, um, the day the offering happened, whenever the Passover sacrifice happened, whenever the various other sacrifices happened every day, they spoke to us about Christ. They said, Christ is coming, Christ was sacrifice. Christ took all the sacrifices, all the, the thousands and thousands of sacrifices offered every day. And you go back to the beginning when this, that was the millions of sacrifices. And he perfectly completed, gave the meaning and said, now they're all happened here on the cross. Here is where something occurs. There's four main reasons that the sacrifice happens, all of which Christ fulfills and completes. If you want the old acronym, the old acronym for remembering this is ACTS. These are the four reasons you offer sacrifice, all three reasons you would pray. So the first reason is adoration, to adore God. Second is contrition, to tell God we're sorry for sin. Third is thanksgiving. Thank God for the gifts and blessings given us. 
and the fourth one is supplication, to ask God for our needs. Christ on the cross does this perfectly. He perfectly gives God worship and honor. This is how he's able to fulfill and perfect and all be wrought and all sorts of God by original sin. It is a sacrifice that forgives sins perfectly because he's come and taken away sins of the world. It is the thanksgiving that we long for God for God's glory, for God's goodness. This is the perfect way we were able to give God that thanksgiving and honor. Right? Think of Noah and the ark. After Noah's ark lands, God's offered a, a sacrifice of thanksgiving and praise, thanking God for his first happiness. Christ comes and offers a perfect praise, perfect thanksgiving for mankind, for everything that's been done. And through Christ, we're able to ask all things in his name. And we're able to do to do these things through his blood. How do we end our prayers? Through Christ our Lord. Well, often do we say that? Because by ourselves, what do we got? Nothing. <laughs> nothing. <laughs> nothing. Not we got nothing. Mm-hmm. But through Christ, and we have the blood of the perfect of the Lord's Lamb, the blood of God Himself. And so now our prayers can mean something. Now we can truly thank God. Now we can truly be forgiven of our sins. Now we can adore God in the perfect way. Without Christ, we can't adore God. Without Christ, we can't think of. Without Christ, we can't be sorry, we can't be forgiven of our sins. Without Christ, we can't truly ask for our needs. But now we can. This is what the sacrifices tell us. Sacrifices point the pave the way and point the way and show us now we can praise and glorify and worship God in a true way. Now we can come to God and walk with God and give God what He deserves. Right? That to me is mind blowing. Um, that I can give God what he deserves. And just think about those words. Yes. <laughs> I can give God something that's worthy of him. Pay God back everything he's given me. Literally. Because he's given me his son to do this. This happens, of course, in the Mass. The offering of these sacrifices to God. This is what all those sacrifices that have done, all these different reasons, different feast days, different days, different events. They point to, they show us, they teach us. Right? Behold the Lamb of God, offer these sacrifices. Yeah, God's pretty cool. <laughs> cool. Okay. One more. All the feasts. If you go to the Testament, there's, there's the different feasts which, you talk, which are we're told celebrate this way, come to the temple three times a year, do these things on this day, eat, this, eat these foods, eat these things. And all of them, there are really three different things going on, the basic things going on. First of all, the feasts speak of God's presence. They show us what God's done for they really are helping us understand salvation history, which is preparation for the Messiah. All of them speak in different ways of how God is coming to save his people, what God's doing for us, how God is coming to us and helping us take care of us. And they're reminding us in a profound way that we're his people. We belong to him. We have been with him. God, God is coming to us to close to us. What great nation is it that God so close to his arm is to us? We never call upon him. So these feasts these are times of joy. They're telling us what God has done for us and how he's coming to save us. And all of them point to what Christ is doing for us. Christ is the great Passover feast. All these, pa- all these feast days point toward heaven, toward eternal life. When Christ, our Passover, comes to redeem us, to bring us to himself, we can truly walk with God. We won't just come to the temple three times a year, we'll live in his presence. We'll live in his light, we'll shine with his glory. Moses came and saw God face to face, and he would shine for a time that he'd fade. We come to the Lord, hopefully, we're, we're doing right, we're gonna hopefully in our souls and hearts, the child of God's light is more and more, child of glory more and more. Until in heaven we're, we're, we're perfected and, and live in eternal glory and shine like this like like the stars, like the sun. This is what these feasts tell us. They show us Christ's presence, God coming to us, the eternal Passover feast. 
Questions on any of this? I'm sorry, I kind of ran through this thing at the end, but yeah, please. What are the primary feasts they're referring to at this point? So you would have had Passover, would have been Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, it would have been the Feast of Booths, which is the remembrance of the Blonde of the Desert, or the Sukkoth, the Feast of Weeks, which is also Pentecost, which is the remembrance of the, uh, the giving of the law, coming God's people. And at that point, I think those were the main, the main ones. But then there were other smaller ones. What was the third one? A piece of booths, or a sukkoth. Wait, I can't. Um, booth? Oh, ten. I'm like, boots. Piece uh -huh. of boots. <laughs> booth. Booth. You've been, to, you've been to Texas lately. <laughs> Feast of booths, uh, or a sukkoth. Um, This is the remembrance of the wanderer in the desert, uh, where, where you would live, uh, they lived for uh, 40 years without taking care of them. And during this beautiful ceremony, where they take a, for the harvest, and they wave it, the wave off. You know what the wave off looked like? Are all these still observed, like the Feast of Booths? Do they still? They, yeah, but they've been modified. There's no temple anymore. Right. Um, but, but, yeah. But they, they still celebrate Yom Kippur and Das, you know. Um, yeah, so they're still celebrated. Feast of, yeah, they're also celebrated. But they're celebrated differently. And, uh, no, it, it, um, if, if you're interested in it, I can pull out. I have a beautiful prayer book that has all the, these, these prayer ceremonies in it, English and Hebrew. Um, wow. So, where does Hanukkah fit in or where? So, Hanukkah is a much later feast. Uh, Hanukkah is after the, it came about in the second century, third century, third century, uh, BC, um, where um, after Alexander the Great had conquered Israel, a uh, hundred years later, you had uh, a king called Holofernes who was by Judaism entirely. And so he destroyed the temple, said that everyone they had to, they had to stop practicing Judaism, and a group of the people left and hid, hid and basically won, to, over time, Maccabees conquered uh, the land back. And they, and they, at that point, conquered the land back and conquered the temple mount back that had been defiled by the, the Greek armies under um, uh, Herod and um, the Greek king. Um, they had they did hate, hate the temple, um, and they celebrated that 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 great day. So the tradition is that um, they only had enough oil uh, for one day. Mm -hmm. um, it lasted eight days, um, which was the time it took to prepare more oil, and it was eight days of celebration. Um, inter inter interestingly to me, uh, Hanukkah um, was the festival of lights. It takes place on the twenty fifth of the winter month. What's our festival of lights? It's <laughs> the 25th yeah. of the winter month. Yeah. <laughs> um, any other questions on this? It's a lot here, right? I mean, again, yeah. the law is a big deal. It's beautiful. And it tells us about Christ. Let me read one quote from, from St. Paul that will end for, for the evening. Because we have such a great hope. Christ, in Christ, we are very bold, or Moses, who put a veil over his face that his eyes might not see the end of his fading splendor. Their minds were hard or darkened. But to this day, when they made the old covenant, that same veil remains unlifted. It is only through Christ that taken away. Because to this day, where Moses is read, a veil lies over their minds. Whenever a man turns to the Lord, the veil is removed. In other words, Paul is saying, Read it and let it rest. <laughs> or you won't get it. So everything you read, let it rest. So, ask the question. Why does Moses speak of Christ? Every, Every day. day. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Questions on this? Let's have a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for your goodness and your glory. 
We adore you for revelation. We thank you for your salvation and your son. Help us understand more and more truly what you've done for us and how you've saved us. And bring us ever more closer to your heart. May all that we say and do be for your glory. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, it is now and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. The Almighty God bless you, the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go in peace. Thanks be to God. If I don't see you, have a great holy week and happy Easter.